I hope you can hear me. I am Guadalupe Rodriguez. I am also a um, regional contact point at the Yes to Life No to Mining. I'm also part of Rainforest Rescue, Salva la Selva, Reddit and Regenwald, and a rainforest organization from Germany. And in this space, uh, together with our guests, um, we will be discussing what is the right to say no, how are communities in the regions asserting the right to say no to mining? And uh, we are going to speak about the diverse tactics they are using to keep their territories mining free. Uh, the idea of the session today is to offer information and inspire, inspiration to others. I will first introduce the speakers we have today with us. Um, Joy Tao is a campaigner with the Pacific Network on Globalization, which is campaigning against the expansion of deep sea mining in the region. He's a Pacific media and communications specialist. Uh, we have also Georgine Kenye. Uh, he's an author, economist, a MacArthur Foundation researcher, and the Right to Say No coordinator for the Pan-African Women Network. Um, they support women organizing to challenging the destructive large scale extraction of natural resources. Recording uh, in progress. That was having place in Colombia and in the whole Latin America very recently. And Emmanuel Penny, also known as Manu, he's a human rights uh, defender. Recording in progress. And organizations through this work learned and support many existing formal and informal ways to say no to mining. These local experiences are an important community body of knowledge and action, and um, they are very useful on a daily best basis when resisting extractivism. From our network point of view, uh, the Yes to Life No to Mining has been having some important conversations about the right to say no with member organization, organizations. Last year, for example, we had two webinars on request of member uh, of the network that wanted to dive deeper in this matter. And we were asking ourselves and others what this is. We managed to organize one session in Spanish, one in English, which was very productive and informative. The discussion um, is very important because as we speak, communities affected by mining projects around the world are in need of legal and practical instruments that support their struggles. And we found the idea of a right to say no, as simple as it sounds, not that simple. And it can be a powerful instrument we want to dive even deeper into today. Uh, so far, we know uh, from these conversations that formally there are many laws where right to say no can be anchored uh, from national, environmental, and other laws. There is, for example, the ELO, ILO uh, 169, and there's uh, free prior and informed, informed consent for 
uh, indigenous peoples. There is the Convention or, um, of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, this first two mentioned instruments are exclusive and specific for indigenous peoples, um, which are confronting particularly a, a, a situation of more uh, danger and harassment uh, as other populations. But there are also others, like in countries uh, like Ecuador, for example, with other alternatives to consultation for non-indigenous peoples. Uh, like the so-called environmental consultations. There are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights currently in discussions. There are due diligence and supply chain legislations uh, in preparation in Europe and Canada, being those regions who hold uh, a big part of the responsibility of what is happening in the global south. And there is really a lot of national, regional, international, and even local um, instruments. But in spite of all that uh, legislations, the reality reflects very often something different of, of what's on paper. Mm. And that is that many existing rights and laws that should be a uh, guaranteeing right to say no are not being respected in many places. So, uh, in order to keep finding ways for this to happen, in order to keep struggling towards an objective, uh, it is important to have a good understanding about the fact that communities do have the right to say no and how to exercise that. Um, Recording what is in the progress. Right to say no unto it in the case of mining projects affecting communities and territories, how can it be useful? So let's know the different experiences of our guests. Mm. Uh, before uh, jumping to our guests, uh, you have the possibility to uh, pop questions in the chat that we will be answering at the end of our conversation. So let's do that any moment you want. Um, um, a goal of this meeting we are having this week is to unite around the different uh, campaigning ideas, goals, and um, we are looking like ways of supporting, and this is about learning from a strong no to mining position, which I think all our guests share. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that's the one very important point. A uh, woman uh, has worked a lot conceptually around the right to say no, which makes uh, a privilege having you, Georgine, here today with us to explain a bit the context of your own right to say no developments of uh, women and how do you un understanding this concept. Can you explain uh, us please a bit uh, the context on how this uh, discussion and work began at your organization? Thank you very much, uh, Guadalupe. It's a privilege for me to be here and to share our experience with you. As you rightly said, I'm working with uh, women, the Pan-African Gender and Extractive Alliance. And the subject of uh, the issue of extraction or extractives and mining basically on women is uh, the core priorities of uh, our organization. So the issue of the right to say no is really very important, as you said, extract, extraction or extractivism, which is uh, basically a sort of economic model, a paradigm the world is using today to extract in the land of, uh, let's say, indigenous people, and now is far beyond the land of indigenous people and is in many communities happening now. What we are saying basically is that this violence is affecting a lot of women life. And then 
what is happening is that when land is uh, taken away from women or from the community, women are the one who are suffering a lot. And we came to the understanding that because the African Union, speaking in the context of Africa, is promoting, you know, extractivism as a way of developing countries, we came to understand that that extractivism is not responding to the needs of the local population, it's not even responding, and it is destructive to environment, to human beings, and to people. So the way we are approaching the issue of the right to say no is that, as you said clearly, that FPIC is in existence, but the issue of consent is not taken into account because some organizations or mining company will do whatever they want to distort the process and communities are not even consulted just to give or to withhold their consent. And in those communities, women are not consulted given the nature of patriarchy in many constituency. So what we are doing basically in these communities we will come in because the community are already saying no to mine because their resources is taken away, their land for their livelihood is taken away. They are saying no and they are resisting. So what we are doing, we are bringing these communities together. We are working on the issue of their rights. So we are speaking with them and presenting all the instruments, the soft law you spoke about and also the hard law you spoke about in your introduction. And then we are also looking at other instruments, basically at the sub-regional level or at the national level. What is very important in the sub-regional level in West Africa is that there is what uh, we are calling with ECOWAS, the Economic uh, Community of West Africa. There is a mining directive stating clearly that before a mining company start extracting in uh, a context or in a village or in a community, they need to sort and get the consent of the community, but this is not done. And in some of our constitutions at the national level, so we have rights to this economic rights. We also have rights to clean air, to clean environment, but when mining company are coming, they are polluting this and the government is not taking in account the rights on their own, on its own citizen. So this is how we are looking at the issue. So we will work with the community for them to assert their rights and basically women to assert their rights in this community. We will uh, speak about these instruments that are in existence and then we will bring all those in desperate you know, situation to come together and bring the right to say no as a political call to action, to defend their right, to defend their livelihood and to defend their environment. Thank you, Guadalupe, just to start with this. Uh, thanks, Georgine. Um, I have to say, I was looking at your materials you developed uh, about the right to say no. Um, these are very uh, complete and powerful materials. Uh, and I was like, uh, after our Yes to Life Not Mining um, discussions, understanding right to say no, as you explain, also um, as a collection of existing uh, legal possibilities to uh, speak about the right to say no. But even I think reading at your uh, conception, I think there's something more. I think there's also something like um, making people conscious about the fact of they are having rights. You know, uh, we could say, I don't know, something not so formal. Can you, can you explain a bit also uh, in this direction if that's a, a, a good yeah. understanding of your ideas? Yes, exactly. So what we are saying is that um, basically when we are speaking about commons, we need to have water. Water doesn't have to be sold. We are speaking about air, clean air. We are speaking about environment. 
And we are also speaking about, when you are speaking about environment, we will see nature and then we will also see forests. So when mining company are, are coming and destroying all these things, you know, like destroying forests, depriving communities and mainly women uh, of their livelihood and also the medicinal plant because they have to take care of uh, the entire community as they used to do, basically providing food and, and, and health. What we are saying basically is that it is important to understand that the rights, when we are speaking about rights, those rights are not just for the powerful people, those who have power, is also about those who are living in the land and in the community. And when you are speak, bringing the issue of justice, what are we calling justice and equity? And then because there is no um, law where we can say in our countries or even at the international level, which is saying that we have right to do this. We are going through some rights, like for instance, the right to occupy and also the right to use land in some of the contexts. In the customary context tradition, for instance, land belongs to a community. Nobody has a right to sell land and say, this is my land and I'm selling it to a mining company. So we are using this customary law in some context to say, you cannot just come at a mining company and discuss with chief or elders in the community, <clears throat> sorry, and land now is sold to you. Land belongs to the community and we have to defend that right. We have to defend our constitution because, sorry, our customary law, because the customary law is a living law. We are living in this context and this is what we need to do. What we are also saying is that we need to stand together in solidarity. When people come together in solidarity, that is a force. Because we have a force, you know, powerful people who are coming with what they have to destroy because what they are looking for basically is just their interests. They are not looking at the human beings. They are not looking at um, what the community may lose. What we are saying is like we are building uh, people uh, understanding on the issues, making sure that we expand powerful women and also community leaders to defend their rights because this all have to do with rights. And this all have to do with, uh, we all belongs to this community and we all have right to say what we want. And now uh, to end with this question, what people do not understand or mining company does not understand, they are thinking that development is a one size fit everyone or fit all. So in communities, sometimes they do not need a dam or they do not need a highway, but they think, or they don't, do not need that extraction, massive extraction. But they think agriculture, they think fishing, you know, fishery and all other type of activities they may develop. Caring for the environment, is their own way of understanding development. So the vision of the community is not, is not taking into account there. And that is where our yes is, is yes to this alternative to development, which is coming to communities from people by people who have been living in the land and know what exactly they needed to do. Thank you, Guadalupe. Thanks, Eugene. That's so interesting and so uh, true, that aspect of uh, belonging and the customary aspect as well. Uh, I hope we can go back to this later, but now it would be maybe a good idea to turn to Colombia, where uh, Renzo can tell us um, about one particular point you also touched, which is uh, people is not being consulted. Um, in Colombia, the communities uh, resisting mining have auto-organized, self-organized uh, themselves to, to uh, put these consultations on the table. 
and Renzo was involved in this kind of, um, of activities. So he can explain us um, what the people do when consultation is not, uh, is not being, yeah, this, this, this obligation of the state to make consultation is not being respected. Tell us a little bit about your process in Colombia and how this uh, all has, has been going with you and what's the, the, the mining threatening in your region. Renzo, please. Bueno, primero que todo, un muy buen día para todos y para todas. Saludarte especialmente, Guadalupe, Mariana, Nat, Jaime, a todos los compañeros del panel. Creo que de verdad esos espacios son de suma importancia para mirar cómo seguimos creando una comunidad global que nos permita defender el agua, la vida, el territorio, la dignidad de nuestra gente. Así que les tiendo un saludo a yo y a Georgina, a Manuel, bueno, a Manu. Y decir, Guadalupe, que nosotros aquí en Colombia estamos en la idea de rechazar lo que hemos denominado como una dictadura. No, to what we call a mining dictatorship. When we refer to that, what are we talking about? And what are we've we've seen like the global economic market that's working on extractivism that are working with politicians on a regional level level on a national level and this is like finishing in, with the real richness of our communities i want to tell you quickly that colombia is a country in the world that has the largest amount of flowers orchids butterflies. We are the second planet in the world that has the most amount of plants, amphibians, palms, reptiles, me uh, mammals. We are a territory with an immense amount of biodiversity, of richness, of water. This is a vinculated with a, a cultural richness, richness new with our with um, indigenous campesinos that have worked so hard on having our own way of um, working. Our real richness is, you know, unfortunately, in the last few years, we have seen how it's been affected with the imposition of extra, uh, extractivism, with mining, um, how this has affected these, these communities that are so rich in biodiversity. What we've done as a community is we've started to organize with communities. For that, what we've been able to accomplish is like a, 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 a integrity and a solidarity between different communities. Um, we are in the capital right now in Lima. Oh, I'm sorry. We have been working with Cajamarca, where a company came, a multinational company came, Anglo Gol, it's called. They wanted to like they wanted to do gold mining, and with that, like finish all the biodiversity and the, the our dynamics of like our food chain, our agriculture. What we started to do is we started talking with the community. We started talking about all the different problems, environmental problems, how they could be affected by pollution, soil, water, air, the competition. Um, you know, for for the water supplies and how this could affect like the whole chain of of our food chain and agriculture. What we started to do is organize different environmental committees in defense of life. What we did is we did different activities. We did we started to go out to the street. We started to march. We started to do demonstrations. And then we saw that there was a huge amount of people that were completely against this extractiv extractivism mechanisms. We saw thousands of people that were opposed to these projects, petroleum, mining. What we started to do, we started to organize like for formal processes to work, you know, to train, to train people, to like educate people on environmental education. And today I can tell you Guadalupe that we have different four different groups 
that have forms that has free information. Um, we've organized and, and trained f with no without charging so many different people to be able to be prepared with different technology that uh, permit like this these exchanges that are taking places that let people you know have obtained to their ethics we've also we've also organized popular consultations um, like informal organizations that talk about like the, or they, they can talk about their organizations their intellectual intellectual understandings um, we've been able to train people in different communities so that they can have the right to say no we've talked to campesinos we've organized with campesinos we've talked with defensors of the water of nature and we keep developing these different things in our country en la práctica cómo se desarrolló ese proceso de de las consultas populares cómo se ve una consulta popular like can you can you tell us a little bit about how these popular consultations take place on in the territory like on a practical level like exactly what happens we had an advantage and i tell you that we had because um, the corporations were able to destroy our right to the constitutional and legal rights to be able to use these legal mechanisms. What happened? The, the mayors, local mayors had a law. Um, I'm just trying to fill you in a little bit on these details so that you have a better understanding. This permitted the mayors to be able to call people for popular consultations to talk about these mining projects. Then later on, another law came out in 2015 that allowed the communities um, from, from, uh, from collecting enough signatures were able to organize against these mining projects. This was put into practice here in a very practical level here in our in our municipality and city hall. Um, a popular. In this moment, what we did is we were able to accompany the communities and go from house to house, explaining to them the importance of participating in these popular processes. Because in Colombia, when a popular consultation has has like legal uh, le is legally binding we needed a certain amount of people in this case we need one third of the electoral of the population that can vote unfortunately there's not a very good culture around democracy here um if like a hundred people can vote only 50 p people vote so we've been kind of analyzing that like the 50% of the 50% that vote, like we need, we need at least one third of the people that can vote. Like 33.3% of the, of the whole, of the whole citizenship that is able to vote. This is, the, so what we do, we've done all different kinds of working, like working directly with communities, being able to talk about all the negative imp impacts that these projects that come with these projects. When the multinationals started to like offering jobs to all these like indigenous leaders, campesino leaders, different presidents of different organizations of nonprofit organizations, people that were like really like representing the community, telling them that mining would bring the development that would create like possibilities of work that's gonna better everybody's life. So we were working really hard to show that this actually isn't the truth. So we did different kind of exercises like this. We tried to like make the educate the community. Um, unfortunately, so many people, you know, are controlled through the TV. So they're they're not on the side of the people. Um, we were able to take advantage of social social media to be able to talk to and all the just the social like networks to be able to talk to as many people as possible 
we were able to like educate people, a lot of people. And now what we're doing is we're defending legally the decision of the community. We're explaining to the government that definitely that people have the right that they have the right to, to continue to be agriculturists, campesinos. That at one point we were like a Spanish colony. And when the Spaniards came here, they imposed mining up through different like organizations and governmental organizations. But for us to have autonomy and for lots of different communities to have autonomy all over the world, all over our country, that's that's what we're defending now is we're defending our own autonomy right now guadalupe let me tell you a little quickly in cajamarca what happened was that um that people got signatures they brought all these signatures to to the correct office and then the the governmental organization of Colombia that's like in charge of taking these signatures, they're able to approve a popular consultation. With that, we were able to approve 33.3%. They only gave us 15 days to be able to educate the entire community on these matters. But we got in, we got in front of this. And also we wanna thank the authorities of so many different communities of so many campesinos from this area and from our country we were, we were able to accomplish lots of activists coming to the community, men, women that are dedicated to this. Um, all of these activists help us get to all the different neighborhoods and we're able to convince so many people that they, they were sitting on the fence about this to continue to continue to being campesinos and that mining isn't going to solve the, any kind of problems. Um, then we saw how so many different municipalities and communi communities saw that it was able to take advantage of um, community participation. And inspiring, and I think that has been uh, been inspiring uh, in other places in uh, all over Colombia and in Latin America as well. So thank you for the testimony. Um, Maybe we can come back later to this experience and to see how it relates to others uh, in other parts of the world. But first, I would like to hear from the uh, Asia Pacific region from Joy and, and Manu. Uh, Joy, uh, you are part of the deep sea mining campaign. So I wonder how all these conversations applies uh, in your work, in your daily work, in your organizational and personal work. And um, I would like to hear a little bit how this is being understood in this other part of the world. Can you explain us a bit? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Guadalupe. And um, thank you for this opportunity uh, to present here on this panel. Uh, and speaking at a a regional approach from the Pacific uh, on the experiences of mining and uh, Pacific communities' response to mining. I was just listening to Georgina and uh, Renzo uh, share their experiences and how they uh, are mobilizing communities. And I think, you know, there's a very clear uh, commonality am amongst not only indigenous peoples, uh, but other developing states uh, or countries for this matter, and how they respond to uh, the issue of extractives. Uh, we, we share similar, similar experiences of how communities are mobilizing, how communities are put at the forefront to respond to extractives, um, and how um, communities are uh, rather are forced uh, to, to engage with states or the developer in, in, in this in this census. Um, I could maybe just draw you back um, to the region here in the Pacific as to how and why Pacific peoples uh, in this part of the region are, um, are mobilizing and are, are standing up to say no to this new frontier of deep sea mining. Uh, firstly, it has never been tested anywhere. Uh, it is a new frontier, it is mainly speculative uh, with projections to do actual mining the soonest in 2023. 
Uh, but just wanted to draw you back to the experiences here in the Pacific where uh, we see communities who have lived experiences. And when I say lived experiences, uh, we've, we're a region that um, many see us as this vast blue ocean with tiny scattered islands. Uh, that's the narrative that's been bestowed upon us. Um, anything could happen, uh, you know, it, it, it's quite vast. Uh, it could absorb anything. Uh, and we're tiny little islands, very little to no people um, uh, live in this. Uh, and again, very little to no impacts will take place. That are, those are the narratives that are proposed to this part of the region. Uh, but we have lived experiences. This region has gone through so much hurt. And when I say so much hurt, I'll draw you back to the days of nuclear testing that happened in the, in the Pacific in the 1940s. Uh, we've had experiences of terrestrial mining in Papua New Guinea, where I come from, uh, that's caused um, crisis, that's caused displacement of people. Um, you've had phosphate mining in some islands of the Pacific where very little was promised, no development um, progression for some of these island states. Again, people were displaced, people have lost their islands uh, or rather have been moved. And again, they're faced with loss of culture, loss of identity. And the, these are the experiences that people in this part of the region, and I'm sure Georgine and Renzo would share or would agree to some of these experiences that we've lived. Uh, they've, you know, they've gone and they've continued to live with. They, it's been, it's, it has a generational impact on um, generations at present. Uh, and that, that is why that it, it informs this resistance to such development agendas, be it mining, um, be it oil palm, be it land grab uh, at large in the Pacific. That is how Pacific people are responding to such development agendas where it is all about lived experiences. It is experiences where um, you've, fought, you've had island, islanders who are being shifted from one place to the other, just so um, nuclear testing could be done for the good of all mankind. You've had people shifted from one island to another so that phosphate mining could take place. Um, you have um, now at, at, at very present, the threat that our ocean in this part of the world is blue, vast Pacific Ocean, uh, it's under threat where you have industries, corporations who are interested to mine. Uh, and for, for Pacific people drawing from those experiences of the past, it, it's something dear to us. The ocean is dear to us. It's something that we draw our identity. We have cultures. Um, we have connections as Pacific people to this, to this ocean. So, for us, an immediate reaction as to why Pacific people are rising up and saying no is it's, it's from the very heart of our livelihood, our existence. It is our oceans, our islands and our people. And yeah, that is one thing that's really mobilizing Pacific people, be it deep sea mining, be it um, gold mining, be it um, nickel mining, uh, the pumping of nickel waste into the ocean in Medang and Papua New Guinea. These are some issues that Pacific people have lived with uh, some very traumatic experiences. And that is why Pacific people are now rising um, to say no to deep sea mining. Uh, and it's, I could attest to this, it is all based on lived experiences. We've seen people being shifted, we've seen people being displaced, um, all, for, all to serve the interest of corporations and you know, a number of greedy developed states. You have touched uh, some uh, very important points, like for example, the, the new frontiers of mining. Um, and also, I think you have somehow given already answer to one question I had, which is um, being the, the problem you confront in your region or the campaign you're working in, deep sea mining, why is it so important to understand um, the, the, the need to say no to mining, to deep sea mining as well? And in this, uh, related to this, you have also mentioned the, the energy transition issues and the minerals that uh, are being like looked for on the oceans. and 
maybe one uh, point to to speak a little bit deeper would be um, why it's important to say no to mining. Uh, in to to say no to deep sea mining and how this relates to the struggles of the people because it can look like you know the mining uh, the the ocean is something not related to to the people or nobody's living on the ocean no people is living on the ocean but what's the importance of this kind of campaigning and and to support your struggles uh, on these issues um as uh, thank you very much as i mentioned earlier elia um the pacific ocean is you know it, our ocean in general, is, its health is declining. Uh, for Pacific people, uh, the ocean is, is, is the heart of our planet. It, it's, it's, it's a source that Pacific people draw an identity to, one, uh, have cust customary relations to, uh, and it is the source of our life. It has sustained uh, generations. It has connected islands, our island nations. So it plays, a, it is like the basis or the foundations of our existence for Pacific people. It's just like someone coming to destroy a house. And for that, for us, it is part of the region. The proposal of deep sea mining is in the context of, it is to destroy our home. Um, and that is why, like I, like I said earlier on, it is this lived experience, be it nuclear, mining on land, terrestrial mining, that Pacific people are rising to say no. A very important thing that we've been running through um, this campaign that we call the Pacific Blue Line is, apart from mobilizing Pacific voices, mobilizing Pacific leaders, governments to uh, arise and call for uh, you know, a global halt to this mad rush. Because at this, at this present time, it's pushed by corporations, uh, it's pushed by developed uh, countries, who have an agenda to, you know, it's all about profit. Uh, but for us in this part of the region, uh, saving um, our ocean, we are mobilizing not only our leaders, um, our parliamentarians or, um, you know, elders, but we are drawing back on our cultures. And like Georgine had mentioned uh, earlier on, it's just going back to restore this, this right of stewardship that, that Pacific people uh, have on the ocean. Yes, we don't own the we don't own the ocean, but we live in this part of the of the world. We are stewards of this, and for for us, our role as as custodians of this vast blue ocean is to protect, uh, to guard, and to safeguard from either extractives, um, other other external interests, be it militarization and so forth. Uh, and we found it very useful just drawing back, and it has I think it has been one of our strongest source of or points of resistance to this, ex, um, to this whole concept of deep sea mining. It's just regaining, uh, using customary law, the importance of customary uh, ocean governance in response to this neoliberal way of thinking, this development agendas that are proposed to our government or are, uh, enticing our Pacific state. It is reminding them that, you know, the ocean is dear to us. It is a lifeline um, and it is, regaining that, that custody and ship over it. And that's, that has been one of our, our greatest pull apart from mobilizing uh, our Pacific leaders. And just recently we've launched a collective of Pacific parliamentarians. Uh, and it is to draw this, we realize that there is an absent of the political regional leadership on the issue. It has become a very sensitive topic where when it's brought into public discourse, it gets kicked under the carpet. Uh, so it's just really driving this agenda, getting leaders to start making mention, start bringing it to the core of policy discussions. And Pacific leaders come this Well Ocean, UN Well Ocean Conference in June is really calling on well leaders to commit to a global ban. For us, it's no to mining, uh, to protect our ocean, uh, to protect our livelihood, um, and it cannot be done here in this part of the world. There was this famous saying back in the days of nuclear free Pacific activism where they, it said, if you can do it in Europe, um, if you can do it in Europe, uh, then you can do it in the Pacific. If you cannot dump it in Japan, then don't dump it, don't dump it in the Pacific. 
And I think that's the line we're towing. If you have not done it in Europe, if you haven't done it in America, it should not happen in the Pacific because it has not been consulted, it has not been concerted, and Pacific people are mobilizing. This makes a lot of sense, what you are saying, <laughs> a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to complement your uh, testimony with a question to Manu, who is uh, having uh, internet problems, so he couldn't join us. And um, the thing is, Manu has personally been violently uh, threatened and har harassed. So uh, his example is like, uh, meant to be one of those of the urgence of the need of a real strong and collective right to say no. Um, so as Manu is not uh, connected, we can see a small video we had prepared for this uh, eventuality. Uh, Nat, would you like to complement this introduction and pop the video in? Thanks, Guadalupe. So yeah, apologies from Manu. He's in WIWAC in Papua New Guinea and at any time power can go out and lack of access to internet. Um, I've had the great privilege of working with Manu and Project CPIC over the last three years. So the video I'm going to show is actually of Manu um, and the community um, mobilizing through their own traditional governance systems, through their house tambourines to say no to the Frida River mine, which if it went ahead would be the largest mine in the world on the, the headwaters of the Sepik River, which is one of the last pristine rivers left in the world. It's also seen as the Amazon of the Asia Pacific region. So I'll stop talking and I will share the video. For us growing up along the river and people belonging to the river, the river is its a spirit that is living. So we have languages and we've got songs and stories that says, you know, it could wake up and it talks to you and it sleeps, it dreams, those kind of stories that, that my mom tells me. And all its life forms, both plants and animals, are connected to us. And that's really important. That's really important. It's, it's my identity and that's going to be killed. I don't know how to That means I represent you, interest for you, interest for you, and life for you. All of the mining that has happened in Papua New Guinea has been exploitative to the environment and the people. We haven't seen any significant improvement or changes in our lives. The Bougainville um, copper there was a civil war, more than 10,000 people died. BHP Steel, that mined in Octeti, in the, in the Fly River, that river is dead. Then we have Pogara, they still have violence up there. So these are the fears. Before Lord White Money come, this is a place, and a place to walk in law. I've, I've received four death threats. I could be taken out, or members of my volunteers could be harmed, and that's that's really um, something that has hit me, but I think it's Pacific River is important, and my livelihood and the livelihood of people I love and my country is important. What is the total development? What am I over? My ground, my heart, my river. Now you like him money, you like him money, kai kai kai. Now you meet talk yes, the money, you be killing life, no to muna blum black and here.
Thank you so much, Nat and Manu, uh, from a distance for the for the video. That's also very powerful. Um, I would say we are we are doing good with the time. So um, I will do an, a last question to uh, yeah to engage with the purpose of these uh, events these days of the Yes to Life, No to Mining. And then we can answer the, the questions that are in the chat. Um, my question would be now uh, to Georgine, um, what can be done collectively? I mean, it's the same question for everyone. So if we can think now together a little bit uh, on the global, hearing at the other participants from the, the different regions, uh, how can this be like strength together uh, or find, uh, find um, a next level of this discussion? So, so how could we think about a right to say no from a global perspective? Uh, would you have uh, any recommendations for people and organizations being interested in, in supporting, in working on these issues, in, in understanding why this is so, uh, so key? to the struggles, Georgine, and then we can go Renzo and then Joey. Yes, thank you very much. I really want to appreciate the input of my other colleagues, Renzo, Joey, and also the video we saw. And to say that all these experience are what we have to take in and share, not just at the regional level, but also at the international levels. We also have to link, if it is possible to link these struggles together, because some people are not aware of the destruction this extractivism are doing on the livelihood of the community. You know, Joy was like speaking, it's hard, you know, it's like at the very heart of our life, at people's lives, because when it's taken away of them, what will remain? Nothing. And these struggles and all this fight needs to be shared at the international level. We also have where we are, if it is possible, because the issue of having strong lawyers or from the communities who can even support some of these actions, because we know that uh, I know taking issues at the court may take a lot of time. So, but the issue of campaigning together in solidarity with strong cases is really very important. We also know that there are in there are contexts where we have like the no goes, you know, the no, we don't need mining to be held or to be happen or to happen in some areas, you know, it's like no mining zone that when mining come at that area, you know, the environment is completely dis destructed. These issues need to be factored in. And we also know that the international communities are speaking about clean energy. We don't need false solutions anymore. So they have to work their talk. If they are saying we have to withdraw from, uh, you know, coal, we have to withdraw from all these projects that are killing and destroying our environment. It's time now for them, to, you know, to walk the talk. And that is what I think we can do in solidarity together, linking the, the struggle in Africa, in Asia, uh, in the Pacific, in Europe, and then, you know, like that solidarity with a lot of pressure will work as we are also adding up the issues of court cases, if need be. Thank you so much. I agree, Georgine, thanks so much. Um, how can you complement Renzo uh, about uh, uh, what can be done globally, internationally, as global network? Bueno, Guadalupe, yo, yo, dir yo diría que Nos toca... Well, Guadalupe, I would say that we need to learn how to work collectively, cooperatively. That's one of the one of the things that we have as as a social environmental movement. What does that mean? We need to be at the disposal of uh, being able to understand 
what I'm living, what Manu, Georgine is living in another. Tienen que afectar a mí. No podemos estar en una perspectiva de vivir bien en esperando que el resto de nuestras comunidades That's what we've been trying to do. You know, that's what our movement is trying to accomplish. You know, the committee of um, in defense of life is we've been trying to operate with that kind of logic of you know solidarity. We're trying to act like a like a little bit like a drop of water. When a drop of water is always like falling on the same exact place, it, it doesn't seem like that has like a real strength like one little drop of water doesn't seem like it has any kind of strength at all but when that drop of water is falling and falling over and over on a rock it can break that rock so it can break you know something that doesn't seem like you can modify or break it can break over time and that's what we've learned from nature when we act like in a consistent way where, where we stay there we're systematic we, we can't rest Um, what we're seeing is that these multinational companies are, you know, have a, lots and lots of money. They have lots of support from different corrupt governments, you know, from our countries. They have support from like even military strength. The only way to be able to, you know, to be able to act against these companies is having the you know capability of being collective, to be able to work together that, you know, that popular strength that we can acquire together um, to, you know, take care of, to, to be able to, to, you know, act, to be able to be strong against all these greedy companies. What, uh, you know, I've been hearing on like deep water mining, um, what I'm hearing, like how they want to do mining, like in these beautiful paradisal places, with beautiful rivers. The reality is that we have to work together with so much strength because that greediness, that mentality, those companies, they're like, they're like finishing with the world. What we're seeing is with mining, the impacts are like unbearable. It, They're see, we're seeing how they're cut, like just finishing with the mountains, with rivers. They're leaving everything with so polluted that our children, our grandchildren, you know what? They're going to have to deal with all of this. Like how like are the effects of like all the, di the dynamics of our, um, of our environmental systems and ecosystems are being destroyed. The only thing that I can say is that we have to work without rest. Um, so that but we have to work so, towards some kind of like a sustainability. So what we have to do is we have to be like happy. We have to, you know, have parties. We have to be, we have to like have, we have to live like in happiness because the weight of this is so heavy that if we don't do that, it won't be possible. If fighting against all of these companies isn't part of our daily life, it'll be very hard to be able to win against these greedy people that don't, I don't even understand why they continue with this kind of logic of finishing and destroying the entire planet. I, I share, um, yo. I mean, that's, after many discussions, I think that's the only way possible, you know. Uh, how can you compliment uh, Joy about what uh, Georgine and Renzo have said? so far about the, the trying to, to have or maintain all of this also at a global level to be connected to, yeah, different proposals that have been done. How, how, what could you add? I, I mean, just listening to both Georgine and Renzo share the experiences and like I said earlier on, uh, as indigenous people, as you know, uh, First Nation peoples, developing states, uh, we share similar experiences. Our experiences are similar and there is a need for global action. Solidarity is important and key. Uh, just as I am beating the drum to stop or resist deep sea mining extractives here in the Pacific, it is just as important as uh, Georgine is working with women uh, to advocate Uh, to educate uh, and mobilize resistance in, in, in Africa or uh, Renzo in Colombia. So I think 
there are important uh, platforms or spaces globally. Um, and I've always had this approach to campaign is that if it's a formal space and it is not welcoming, it should not stop you from creating your own space or your own global response. Uh, but solidarity is key and I totally agree with my two fellow uh, uh, panelists uh, on, 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 you know, on responses. Just wanted to draw you to the Pacific experience uh, in, in line to this deep sea mining campaign. Uh, you know, 14 islands and territories, rather 15 islands and territories scattered uh, across this vast blue ocean. Um, it, it can be challenging to draw solidarity. The experiences differ. Uh, people's culture and um, approach to development agendas differ. Um, so I'll draw you back to 2009 when Nautil is a mining company, um, which Natalie was also, uh, has and is, continues to be part of this collective of Solwara uh, warriors. Uh, and it was, it was first proposed to Papua New Guinea, or rather Papua New Guinea had issued the first world's commercial mining license back then, come 2012. Uh, and it took that experience from Papua New Guinea uh, to see how it was jumping into this, trying to be the first, uh, had no legislations in place, um, rather, and was just experimenting this. This whole process was an experiment. Um, and it took us from there as, as, as a collective of Pacific NGOs, key players as church leaders, um, indigenous leaders, uh, youth movements, women's groups to really mobilize and to draw from where Papua New Guinea had, had started to draw this specific response. Um, and from that time on till now, uh, we really have to allude to experiences of Papua New Guinea where it has bought us time. It has made us mobilize specific voices, specific peoples to draw that line and hold time, to ask for consultation, to demand um, you know, free prime from consent from government, to be part of consultations, be it in a formal space and informal setting. Uh, and to this date, um, the campaign has just grown to not only from Papua New Guinea, but you've, we've also seen the investors or the, these corporations who have gone from Papua New Guinea to some of the other islands, be it the Kingdom of Tonga, uh, Nauru, uh, the Cook Islands who have expanded and that is how our solidarity has grown. And that's just a regional ex um, example of how solidarity movements have you know, grown in the Pacific. We have partners in Asia, in Australia and New Zealand, uh, and even in Europe, we have partners who we are calling to, as much as we are calling to keep our governments at account here, you in Europe, you in Africa need to keep your governments at account. It is you in Europe that your companies or companies in Europe are trying to exploit mineral resources here. So it's just, you know, drawing those solidarities to keep our governments at count, keep a track on, on, on um, these corporations. Um, but that, that, that is the story of the Pacific drawing from that, that PNG experiences. And again, I think the key word for me is the learning experience. We all have lived experience. Georgine has experiences. Renzo has experience. How do we build on those experiences? How do we mobilize, advocate, and educate our, our peoples to respond better? How do we provide alter, de, alternative de, development agendas for our people? So I think for us from that, in this part of the region is building solidarity, uh, looking at other parts of the region. And a very key thing I would say, before I forget, is sometimes we perceive our governments as the enemies. Uh, we perceive our governments as being lured into this. We also have to have this approach to viewing governments as partners in development, as partners or, or partners to addressing the issues. So some of the experiences that we've learned from Papua New Guinea is how do we best work with our leaders? We need to share the same table to be to demand consultation, we need to be, uh, we need to call them out, um, but we also have to remind them that they are just as equal partners. And I think that is a growing experience here in the Pacific. Thanks, Joy. I think that uh, relates to something Renzo said before about like the need to educate 
also the governments and to say what needs to be done uh, instead of what's been uh, done. I will start with the uh, questions as a continuation of this conversation because that's all so interesting and and uh, people who is listening has also some questions. So the first one is um, um, coming from Lyon, uh, one of our uh, dear regional contact points in Asia. He asks, um, how have you approached mining workers, especially locals based in the host villages or in the places where mining the mining project exist. Uh, do you have successful experiences of uh, convert them to the other side? That means to our side, so to say. Do you have experiences, some of you, uh, on this that could be give answer to this question? Jordine, I think you... Yes, yeah. So if you are Melo, I can go first. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I think, let me just cite a community we are working with. This is Bombore in Burkina Faso. You know, Burkina Faso is one of um, the key country exporting gold in West Africa. So in the community, when mining came, they told the community that uh, they will have, they will be working at the mining company. Then when they started operation, the staff or the workers came from another regions they were not from the community and what they were giving to the community were this pity pity job of cleaning and it was really very easy for us basically to speak not only to men and also to women that what they are promising this mining company are moving around with false promises and not doing the right thing and in that community when the mining came in Basically, the community were doing artisanal mining. So that was taken away from them. So that was the artisanal mining was their source of livelihood. Now that they do not have it because the mining permit was given to the, you know, in the mining permit, the area where they were doing their artisanal mining was taken away. They joined the campaign easily because they are so, the, their, their source of livelihood was taken away from them. That is really one thing. The other communities where we worked in, we had tension basically in South Africa where some member of the community will easily join, but some will not easily join. And this has to do with corruption where we have you know, some people from the mining company moving around and corrupting some of these influential people in the community, you know, to bring division and even to support mining. So most of the time when they are supporting mining is not because they want to do and they have a sort of added value. It's just because they are corrupted and mining are using divisive tactic to continue the work in the community. This is what I can say uh, answering this question. Thanks, Georgine. Um, there's also another question. I don't know if someone wants to, to compliment or share about this. Other way I can uh, make the next question. Guadalupe, yo te complemento algo muy... um, I have something very small that I would like to share to add to that. What usually happens with the companies as they come to the territory, they give work, they take advantage of the of the lack of presence of the state, of government officials, and what they usually do, or what the community usually does, um, when like a confrontation starts for between people that want mining and other people that work for the mining company. It's like a it's like a conflict that is continually happening that ends up even resulting in personal problems because there's been like a division and in the development of the community and there's confrontations on a personal level. What we do is find ways without, you know, insulting the workers because usually the workers are like the neighbors, the friends, the cousins. 
So what we started to do is that we saw that the fundamental conflict is against like the model, the multinational company, the presence of this company. And that's what kind of like avoids that we come to fall into the game that they want us to fall into of creating division. Um, what they usually try to do is they give work to certain people and they try to like draw those people in favor of the company. So what we do is we leave them alone and we say, Tranquil, tomorrow we're going to we're going to see what's going to happen because that company, I'm sure, is going to like fire you tomorrow because that's what they usually do. In Cajamarca, there was like workers that were there like five, ten years and then the movement arrived and um, they were able to point out like where the company was like polluted water, where they polluted the earth, where different accidents happened, where like different or all the distinct problems happen. And that was very important to like avoid fighting amongst ourselves, but to be able to open the conversation and understand better that the conflict doesn't come from the workers, but it comes from the model of development of extractivism that's so highly contaminant, polluting. Different approach, approach as Georgine, but yes, that's something also happens a lot. Um, Joy, I think you also wanted to complement uh, something about this question. Um, I, I was hoping to answer the next question, but in in in, in relation to deep sea mining, um, with no actual, uh, there was exploration done in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but with regards to the line of work we do in the region and governments that are that are championing this whole issue or rather sponsoring uh, the issue of deep sea mining, be it in the Pacific or in the area, is, is, is trying to influence the policy space that we are working with. How do we flip some of our countries or Pacific states to move from an outright sponsorship to either a moratorium or an outright ban, which some of us in civil society uh, that are that, that are pushing. So we've seen progress with some of the partner organizations, be it conservation groups that we've been working with over the past 10 years who have moved from sustainable mining to moratorium, positions of moratorium. Uh, it, it may not be governments, but it's, it's good to see key partners in, in the NGO sector who have shifted from uh, positions or stands that were enabling or rather facilitating uh, mining uh, policies to one that calls for caution, one that calls for um, proper and higher better standards, one that calls for um, um, a moratorium. Uh, but our aim is to really mobilize um, states in terms of policy to ensuring uh, better standards are in place uh, or to take options of a moratorium or a ban. An indefinite ban. Thanks, Joy. Um, you can stay to answer the, the next question. Um, I will also uh, point to a whole event we are having tomorrow uh, about that will be trying to give answer to this question as well. Uh, so keep connected tomorrow as well for the next event. But the question is climate change and the transition to clean energies are pushing to increase mining. And how is how are the different regions experiencing this push? Um, so remember about the event tomorrow as well, everyone. What can you say about this, uh, Joy? Um, in this part of the region, we're at the forefront of climate change, experiences, experiencing the real impacts of climate change, something that very little to no responsibility that Pacific people, um, but yet we are experiencing a change in weather patterns, ongoing cyclones, uh, submerging islands, uh, losing ease at uh, boundaries, uh, and that's what we are facing uh, in this part of the region. Again, we're caught in this part of, in, in the Pacific, we're caught into responding to climate change or for, you know, for the common good of all mankind. Um, we, we are 
serve these narratives that, yes, we need to mine your ocean floor to have this renew this rare minerals to create this green revolution, you know, to create green, clean energy. Uh, and the Pacific is once again put in this whole position as championing climate change. Unfortunately, we really, for, for, for this part of the region is trying to really make our people understand is that- El, they, Es necesario que gente que entienda los impactos. Eh, nosotros necesitamos preservar nuestros océanos, proteger nuestros océanos. Eh, este océano nuestro está en desclive, su salud está en desclive. Regula nuestro clima y cómo se va la, cómo se cuál es la lógica destruir el océano para crear algo barato. ¿Cómo podemos a lograr esta revolución de verde? Necesitamos eh, este concepto de tenemos que responder a los impactos del clima. Eh, a veces este, buscar estos minerales raros eh, y hoy minerales este, escasos eh, que están en el fondo del océano. Pero bueno, de nuevo, la lógica es decir a nuestros estados, a nuestra gente, cómo, cómo se... Thanks, Joey. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, I will uh, read the next two questions for you to, to see which one you want to uh, answer the different uh, speakers. Um, one of them is um, if you could share uh, your thoughts on the perspective of the, co the community's perspective to the concept of sacrifice zones and how this relates to the right to say no, that would be one question. And the other is, uh, correct me if I'm understanding that wrong, someone is asking um, about if, the, if there's possible to, to, if there are experts to be found on the ground, on the communities to, to to confront all these aspects we are discussing. I don't know if I'm understanding the question right. I think Nat was trying to clear that. If you can help complement, that would be great. Um, who wants to answer some of these uh, questions? Georgie. Yes, yes, I can start. Uh, basically, yes. yeah, basically when we are speaking about expert, it's true because um, we can fear that uh, they may jeopardize uh, the work of community. Like today, when we are speaking about uh, community resisting, we do not have NGOs who are speaking on behalf of the community. But what we are saying is that uh, when we educate and when we bring you know, the majority of the community to understand what is at stake. Those at least who have some knowledge, basically as lawyer, lawyers or whatsoever, you know, they can also join the community when they are mobilizing. For instance, we say we do not have like, um, we may need, uh, you know, different approach to get to our goals. For instance, if we have mining companies who are coming with the intention to consult the community and seek consent, we remember that they need, they always have a lot of materials. They may have complicated words. And what is important in FPIC, you know, in the free and prior informed consent, is that the documentation should be sent to the community in their local language, the way they will understand and fully make, you know, like uh, informed decisions. So if we have lawyers in the community who are already part of the community, then they can, they can help. And it's very important as the question was, um, was formed that uh, we need to be careful that in the long run, we don't have to pay, you know, uh, the so-called expert who might come to deprive the community with what they do not really have. 
now responding to the second question on the no mining zone yeah this basically have to re reinforce the call of the right to say no as we said you know is the is a call of those who are in desperation and coming together to to defend their livelihood and if they are lost like that so we need you know like the we have in many communities what people are calling their heritage some of the community half the area you know it's like they need and in these big let's say big countries in the world we are sure that they do have mining when i i visited canada and went to the niagara falls sorry to speak about this it it was clear that uh even there there was mineral but it's not extracted so in many communities we also have to 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 speak and use all this no-go zone, you know, mining zone, as uh, a tools we can support to defend our right to say no. Because, you know, some mining, so, sorry, some minerals need to remain underground for harmony and also for the protection of environment. This is uh, the comment I can make to the two questions. Guadalupe, I would add to that as well. The first thing is we have to understand that this struggle is not a struggle between experts. You know, we don't need the doctor in geology or biology or uh, to come and tell us to support an exercise of defending territories. However, that doesn't mean that we don't need those uh, that knowledge and that perspective. Um, you know, so to, to, to kind of to complement this question, we need to take into account how, at a national, international level, and we can use teams via like like support each other via teams, like create networks where we can share experiences, we can uh, show how in lots of places in the world, it has been more than proven the negative impacts that those mining projects could have on the effects on the water, on the air, and try to share this information, these issues. Uh, undoubtedly, there will be moments where as a community, if we want to walk the line of a defense of land via like a, a legal process that of course means different types of advocacy more expert more support more judicial support but if we don't have the support of someone in the community or we don't have someone in the community let's see how we resolve that for example in my country we're seeing that this concept of mining has completely like upset our system because there are mining projects everywhere and we don't have the capacity to our solidarity can't be in every single municipality in the Department of Tolima and other parts of. So now we need to look at how do we create some type of process of forming of, of um, training. And that's the, 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 the Diplomado program or the diplomas. So now we do it virtually so that any person of the department or the country can connect with us and we can do via those uh, academic exchanges how can we develop capacities, organizations with regard to personal, the, those narratives of the territories with the objective of uh, strengthening the defense of, of lands and of, of defensive territories? The ideal thing would be that the community with the land that's, that they're fighting for, that they have their ability to defend their own, their own, their own land. They're, but sometimes we need support networks and solidarity messages. Sometimes our struggle is, uh, as far as our project against La Colosa, we invented this campaign, a thousand photos against the La Colosa project. And we had photos from all over the world where there was a, like somebody had a little sign and there were Europe and Africa, wherever, where they had a little uh, a, a poster that says, you know, supporting the, the, the people of, of Colosa. And this, this was good to, to the people of, of uh, locally to see that solidarity from all over the world with this struggle. And we need to implement in a local and, and, and regional way. I took myself with 
together with all the rest, uh, the other regional contact points uh, of the Yes to Life, No to Money, uh, one of these photos. Uh, I would give uh, Joy one last word uh, if he wants to, um, to complement, to answer these questions, and then we can close as we are, we already reached our time um, and we can say goodbye. Thank you. I'll, I'll make it very quick, and it's just in response to this pool of experts or, you know, mobilizing resources, and I think that's, that's a greater need for some of these that are uh, activisms that are at the forefront, activism that are happening at the policy level, um, or, you know, at the regional level, uh, and for the organization that I am part of, uh, and part of this regional collective is also just highlighting resource people, experts, specific experts uh, that we could draw, uh, not only for us, but other, um, other line of work that we do. Uh, Pang, an organization that I'm with, uh, looks at our ocean of struggles. And when I see our ocean of struggles, it's just not only focused on um, extractives, but it also looks at issues of self-determination the right to self-determination, how people or um, you know, economic self-determination for territories in the Pacific. And unfortunately, I would say we have territories in, in the Pacific that are still under colonial rule um, in the context of West Papua, uh, French occupied Polynesia, uh, New Caledonia, who is still under French occupation. Um, and we have approached uh, you know, these common struggles of self to trying to achieve self-determination, human rights um, through this collective of mobilizing people, be it self-determination, nuclear issues, um, deep sea mining, terrestrial mining is, we try to bring our people who are, you know, this ocean of struggles and how can we best mobilize to respond. And that's something that we've been working within the Pacific over the past decade. A very, Quickly, very last uh, or important experience that I learned is from the Republic of Vanuatu in the Pacific, who we normally perceive experts from outside, experts from within who have technical advice and so forth. Uh, but it, was, it goes back to having the custodianship of you, you, you yourself are experts. Indigenous people are experts. Um, you know, Africans are experts. People on land are their own experts. Um, so they had to go back and do consultation, going back to customary law without sourcing external experts. People realized that we are the guardians of our land. Uh, we are champions of our land and we can demand as to how, how we would like to develop it. So there was one experience from Vanuatu that uh, for me to this day still stands out that people had recognized or had bestowed back on themselves as the real experts of their development goals and their development path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Georgine. Thank you, Renzo. Thanks, Manu. Also, uh, although he's, uh, he was not able to join technically, but uh, the video was also very powerful. I, I, I will close this uh, conversation very happy because I have the feeling we have touched a lot of uh, important aspects and a lot of the conversations that are going around in all these circles. And um, I remember the, the webinar that we still have tomorrow uh, in different um, parts of the world, uh, according to the region you are at. Um, I can also remember that that's the platform because there, there was many comments on the chat about people wanting to share more, to, to, to give their testimony as well. So the platform, the FeedLoop platform is a very good way to do that, to find others to connect and to be in connect also with us at the Yes to Life, No to Money Network. I think we at the, at the Yes to Life, No to Money Network are trying, are trying to do a part of what you have shared through your experiences uh, to build up, um, trying to, to replicate 
those knowledge and those experiences and creating this space for people to exchange that you are demanding that's urgent and necessary. So, so let's keep finding ways to do that in a, in a good way. And maybe as a last conclusion point, um, I, as the, the, trans, the ecological transition, so-called ecological transition was also raised in these conversations, um, maybe as a conclusion uh, that can um, yeah, relate this conversation to the one uh, of the right to say no. Uh, sometimes we are finding ourselves in discussions that aim to cover, for example, the mineral and, men and metal demands for the needs of this ecological transition from primary mining, from mining that is happening in all uh, the communities you are working uh, with and um, taking in account for example, that Europe has a very negative uh, material balance, importing uh, way much more materials than Europe consumes. And that's also the same in other regions. Um, I think the, the aim of our network is not to look for ways of the less destructive mining or, you know, not that kind of discussions, but to support those frontally saying no to mining, saying no to mining, uh, looking for this right to say no and asserting for this right to say no. Um, and yeah, I think hearing at these testimonies is helping us like not losing this, uh, this, um, this perspective and this uh, objective, which is at the end of the day to support people who is saying no to mining. So with that, I would say bye to everyone uh, and see you tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you very much uh, to the technical uh, support team, to the interpreters, to the guests, to everyone. <laughs>